Hi, I'm Tom Lochtefeld, and this is an introduction to sysrep.com, an open access document curation platform. You can find me at Tom Lewin on Twitter, and you can find sysrev at sysrev1. So what is sysrev? Sysrev enables structured review. That's the basic idea. Um, what is a structured review? Well, the first step is collecting articles uh, from, from places like PubMed, which is directly inter integrated into sysrev. You can upload your own PDFs and really upload a lot of different data types like JSON or text documents. Once you've uploaded a whole bunch of articles, you need to find some review tasks. Uh, maybe you're going to ask reviewers to identify the drugs in different, in different articles, or identify genes, or identify adverse events, or maybe do more abstract things like determine whether an article fits some sort of um, inclusion criteria, or whether you like an article or not. Uh, so after you define review tasks, Cicero starts helping out by automa automatically distributing those tasks to humans and algorithms. Uh, this is where algorithms come into play. The algorithms prioritize review uh, in, order, in order to optimize the rate of machine learning. And uh, they also try to replicate what the reviewers are doing. Once your review is complete, or actually at any point during the review, you can export those results to a spreadsheet, or you can access them via API. So that's the basic idea. Collect articles, define review tasks, distribute review tasks, export results. What can you do with a structured review? Well, one thing you can do is design recombination therapy. Uh, this was one of the motivating projects we had for CISREV a few years ago now. Uh, we were working with uh, Dr. Channing Peller at the Johns Hopkins Medical Institute, and we were interested in using algorithms to design combination therapies for cancer. When you're starting that project, the first problem you have is identifying data sources. Uh, clinicaltrials.gov, of course, springs to mind. Uh, OpenFDA seems pretty useful. You identify drugs and have it adverse events. And uh, PubMed, of course, is quite useful. Lots of useful information in there. These, these databases have uh, different levels of structure, though. OpenFDA is mostly structured data. Uh, clinicaltrials.gov is semi-structured. So trial descriptions and eligibility criteria are unstructured. Um, and things like drug identifiers uh, are soft, st softly structured. At clinicaltrials.gov, you'd have to use uh, something like a, um, a synonym list to figure out which drugs are used with which trials. And finally, PubMed is almost entirely unstructured. Basically, you have titles and abstracts. There's a lot of metadata that's structured, but um, if you're trying to extract information from these articles, you're going to have to ac actually look at a lot of text and extract that information. OK, so once you've identified your data sources, you should figure out some questions you need to answer in order to design a combination therapy. You might ask what drugs have been used together, what adverse events have been observed, what diseases have been treated, which genes have been targeted. Uh, and these questions are going to lead to you querying different data sources, like PubMed or clinicaltrials.gov. You can even create a hierarchy of these questions, like we did for this project, tracking things like administrative questions, progression, design, metadata, and, and clinical questions. Once you have a whole lot of answers, the first thing you can do is put a publication together and report your results. Um, other people might want to use your data, uh, and certainly they might want to read about it first. Um, a, big, a big differentiating factor between CISREV and other platforms is that public projects are open access. That means anyone can access all the data you generated for your review. Uh, that's really useful if other people are actually trying to use your results. Of course, if you've got all this data, uh, you ought to give a shot at actually using the data to do something. We designed a very simple algorithm for, uh, for ranking different combinations of drugs. One of the highest ranks we got was for Bevacizumab plus Erlotinib plus Everlimus. And it was pretty cool to see that there's actually a phase one clinical trial uh, with those drugs. So hopefully that's a little bit of a motivating um, example. But I want to stop just for a second and, and, and tell you why I thought CISREV was something I personally felt strongly we should go after and the people who I work with agreed, and, and we all decided to build CISREV together. Uh, there's a unique problem facing us today, and that's that the amount of data in really every domain is completely exploding. Um, so it, it used to be that you could understand many different fields at a, at a detailed level, at the same time be a so-called Renaissance man. That stopped being possible a long time ago. Uh, now it's not really even possible within specific fields. You know, if you were looking at medical devices, there's really nobody who's, who's read up all the information on every medical device. Even if you're looking at medical devices, uh, specifically stents, you'd have to read tens of thousands of articles a year to uh, read every article, which you might not need to, need to do to be an expert. But the minute you start filtering out articles, 
uh, the minute you're relying on, on something to do that filtering. So what are we to do? We have these huge data sources coming up. It's no longer possible for humans to consume all that data. Uh, some things we do are, are use things like search engines. Uh, but actually, this is a really good opportunity to start combining human reasoning with, with algorithms. A very simple example of this kind of algorithm is the delta method. In the delta method, you collect a whole lot of experts. Let's use an example of uh, nuclear power experts. And you might ask them, how do we design a better nuclear power plant? <clears throat> they all come up with their own solutions. You collect those solutions, and then you distribute them to the experts again. And you ask them to rank the solutions. At the end, you have a ranked list of solutions. And that might be useful. It might be better than throwing all those, all those nuclear power physicists into a room and telling them, hey, come up with the best power plant design. Um, and certainly, it'll be different. <clears throat> it's a way we can leverage a process, an algorithm, to come up with better answers. And it turns out, today, we can do things like the delta method, but we can kind of superpower it with the machine learning methods we have. The machine learning methods are not capable of doing what our, what our miraculous brain does. They don't generalize in the way that humans do. They can't set sub goals in the way that humans do yet. Uh, and human brains are, are miraculously powerful, but very limited. Uh, and so hopefully by combining these two, we can allow humans to work better together uh, and better with large sets of data. So that's the motivation for us. I'm going to be getting into a couple of the details for CISREP now. I mentioned already that CISREP is open access. Uh, that helps to solve redundancy. If you search Prospero, a registry for systematic reviews, for lead reviews, you'll find hundreds or thousands of reviews on lead. There's nothing really wrong re with redundancy, except that in many cases you'll see repeated work. Uh, and many of you might know that these systematic reviews can take up thousands of man hours, sometimes more. It'd be nice if we could reduce that. The first step in reducing that redundancy is allowing people to find, uh, being, allow people to find systematic review data quickly. Um, so if you go to sysrev.com slash search, um, you'll find a whole lot of projects that have been run. About a thousand projects have been run since we launched uh, last summer. And you could search for things like cancer. Uh, we have a couple other a couple of other topics you can search for. Of course, not only are these things findable on sysrev.com slash search, but if you're on Google and type in sysrevaris, uh, you'll find a whole bunch of, of surgical group sysrevs. If you type in sysrev gene hunter, you'll find our, our review on uh, finding genes in medical text. Okay. Another good example of using open access is Dr. Lena Smirnova's classroom project on sysrev about evidence-based toxicology. So this project uh, was started in 2018, and Lena ran a Coursera course to teach students how to uh, understand toxicology documents. This project is ongoing, and it's got 4,000 documents in it about, and Lena can check in any time and see how many of those documents have actually been reviewed by her students. She can check the progress over time. She can even see how many students have registered on her CISREV. Those students, on the other hand, can very easily just go to a link and click another link to join the project, and then they're off to the races. They can get going immediately. Another really cool aspect of this classroom assignment is that all the data these students are collecting is usable. Uh, so classroom assignments are interesting in that you know, they're a good way to, for students to learn things, um, but also they're an opportunity to generate some real value. If you have 100 students all extracting information about articles, uh, that data can actually be used by researchers down the line. Um, so here you can see some of the information being extracted in this review. I'm going to focus on the outcomes uh, label here. You can see these dark purple labels. A circulatory system is at the top. So let's go on. Here you're going to see me scrolling down this review, and eventually I'm going to click on the, the uh, heart outcome. So you can see these are the answers. That's the landing page for, for Lena's project. After I click on that outcome, it takes me to this article search page, and I can see there are 58 results. Actually, I can click on that link right here. And the cool thing about this is that I can share this search link with anybody. So if I tell you that 60 articles have had the outcome uh, cardiac uh, or circulatory system, heart, blood, flow, et cetera, extracted from them, uh, you don't have to trust me. I can just give you a link, and you can see the number right up here. That's one way that CISREV rem removes the need for trust in systematic review. Another good example of this was a review we did on clinical trials. Uh, with, a, with, a, with a physician who at some point asked me how many of these trials use the placebo. Now, placebo was something we were extracting from those trials, so I didn't have to remember or, you know, 
she didn't have to trust me to give her the right answer. I just had to give her a link. She could immediately see that 12 of her trials had used a, a placebo. Okay. <clears throat> so let's keep going. Another way that we remove trust from the equation is in auditability. Uh, so Dr. Le uh, Dr. Katsit Sound at Johns Hopkins University uh, ran a review on the effects on liver as observed in experimental animals. It's sisterof.com slash p slash 100. Anybody can go there. You can go there right now. And I can share the results of any specific article review with anybody. Now, this is kind of a simple example where if I look at this link, I can see, okay, you know, it looks like Katja was here and there was another reviewer and they identified our as the as the compound and that it wasn't primary research. They excluded this article. Uh, and this might not seem that useful, but you can imagine reviews on, on much more comprehensive documents, like maybe a pre-manufacturing notice, where people are working hard to come to conclusions based on that document. Now, if they want to share those conclusions with somebody, uh, they can summarize those conclusions in an email and send them over to somebody, or they can just provide a link, and that link will take them to the article where those conclusions were made, and will show them who made those conclusions um, and exactly what data was extracted. That's another way you can remove uh, you know, the loss of information that comes when you start communicating that information over email or in person. So every article review, every document review generates a link that you can share with anybody. Another way that open access is quite useful uh, is when you can combine it with the ability to clone projects. Uh, so CISREV allows project cloning, and cloning is similar to what you might imagine with a, a code repository, where you can clone uh, someone's code repository and instantly have access to all the code they've written, and perhaps add to that code, improve that code. <laughs> On CISREV, you can clone a project. You can clone the labels that were created for that project. Uh, you can clone the reviewers that were used for that project. You could clone the uh, documents that were used for that project, or some subset of those. All the information can be propagated into a new review at any time, as long as it's a public review or you have private access to it. The GESI Group, the Global Enabling Sustain Sustainability Initiative at GESI.org, uh, used this ability to generate eight projects on humanitarian evidence and conflict and war. You can kind of think of this as like a template. A template. If I go to this first review, what you can see is this is an interesting project on 50 articles. It's got three reviewers. And they're extracting information like what kind of population was it, migrants, refugees, internally displaced persons, etc. And you can see they're collecting a lot of interesting information from these articles. Now, if they're working with lots of subgroups, those different groups might want to replicate this review, but on a different set of articles. And so Gessie just cloned their review and distributed that review to other reviewers. So I click on the second review they did. I can see some of the same reviewers, some different reviewers, and they're collecting the exact same kind of information. If I go ahead and type in humanitarian into the search bar here, I can see exactly, uh, I, I can see that they've done this about eight times now. <clears throat> okay. So we're trying to generalize this process to any kind of review. Um, so you might want to review uh, titles and abstracts from PubMed. You might want to review PDFs. You might re want to review any other kind of citation information you have. CISREV makes a lot of that easy, and we're actually adding new data sources all the time now. Um, so you can, uh, you can upload your own PDFs. You can upload an RIS file from your citation manager. Uh, you can search PubMed directly on CISREV, which enables things like living review. Uh, and you can now search clinicaltrials.gov on our beta site. So if I just go here, give it just a moment. You can see I've created a review on breast cancer. Uh, we're already exporting, uh, importing some mesh terms. Um, yep, I can look at these, uh, these articles, and I can see that there's a whole bunch of JSON in here. Uh, we're working on this to display it in different ways so that you can do a review on just the summaries from clinical trials or some subset of the fields for clinical trial. Okay. So some examples of those different kinds of, of data, different kinds of document reviews. Uh, the first one is work we did with Dr. Channing Peller to review vitamin C, I mentioned it earlier. Um, in her project, she wanted to track things like what was safety toxicity data reported for the trial, was it placebo use, was it multivitamin delivery of vitamin C, was the dose level, what was the administration method, uh, and, and, and some other information. You can see the view here, so the reviewers could see the official title, the summary, various other information. 
Now we can actually go to that project at sysrev.com slash p slash 6737. I want to emphasize the ease that we can go ahead and look at anybody's project so long as it's public, which you see in the upper right. If we look at an article, uh, we can see this one was reviewed by Jua, and you can see exactly the information she extracted from it, and you can see the view that she has while she's reviewing. Okay, I can't share the results of this yet because it's being published in a, in a book chapter, an oncology book chapter, uh, but the gist of it is, is that vitamin C is being used more and more uh, and in different kinds of combinations and for different, different diseases. We work with the Sustainable Research Group, who uses CISREV to help analyze safety data sheets for their furniture manufacturing clients. Uh, they worked with Ed Taylor, VP of Our Environamics, who mentioned that this project was pretty easy, that they could uh, actually run this review at three separate facility locations using multiple people, and there was no problem. It was easy, verifiable, and expensive. Thanks very much, Ed, uh, for saying that. Um, you can review PDFs with no problem on CISREV. You just upload those PDFs in a zip file, for the most part, uh, if you're uploading a zip file of PDFs, you can have a public project that does that, but we are not gonna show those PDFs to the world until we've resolved the copyright issue uh, for PDFs. So for now, if you make a PDF review, all those PDFs will be hidden. Finally, we can talk about automation just for a minute. Uh, that's a big part of what I do for a living, build machine learning models, and what a lot of us do at, at Adin Silica, um, the company creating CISREV. And uh, so it's, it's a big part of what we think about. And we're trying to get automation into the system more and more. Um, so one way we do that is, is sort of a baby version of what's called optimal experimental design. Uh, we want to prioritize human reviewers so that we can reduce the amount of time they're, they're, they need to review for as much as possible. To do that, uh, right now we're optimizing on screening. So screening is the inclusion or exclusion of individual articles. Uh, we do that in three steps. First, humans label uh, up to 25 articles, then the machine learns, uh, and then the machine sorts articles by their learning value to the machine. And then the process repeats. Uh, this can have some interesting effects, um, but in the background, the models aren't just learning how, how to screen articles, they're actually learning how to, uh, how to estimate every single categorical label uh, defined in, in the given review. Uh, that uses it uses a multitask neural network with a, with a, word, with a, doc, uh, a, a document embedding vector that we've trained on Wikipedia and PubMed and um, some other sources. Okay, so one kind of fun thing that happens here is that after you've been reviewing for a while, your review tends to get a little bit more difficult because the machines already learned the, the articles that are obviously going to be included or going to be excluded and you won't receive those articles anymore. We've actually received this feedback from our users uh, that they found that after, after reviewing a few thousand articles, suddenly the articles become a lot more gray, right? Or a, a lot more difficult to discern. And that's an interesting effect. It's actually, you want to get to that point as quickly as possible because those edge cases are exactly the ones that define the boundaries for inclusion and exclusion in your review. We're really transparent about how well these models work. Um, right now, they're only displayed for, uh, for screening, but here you can see three results for uh, Projects run by Eris. Uh, Eris is a surgical group. If I go to sysrev.com slash uh, search and just search for Eris, you can see some of their projects. If I pull one up here, you can see on this project, um, you know, they, they had a bias towards articles being included and the models were able to separate these two classes. So over 0 0.5 means that the article, uh, that the model thinks that the, the article is likely to be included. Under 0 0.5 means the model thinks the article is likely to be excluded. The red bars are articles that were actually excluded by reviewers. And the green bars are articles that were actually included by reviewers. So you can see these histograms actually get updated every 25 articles or so. Um, and you can keep track of how well the models are working. If they're not working well for your project, then you shouldn't use them. Uh, if they are, then you should consider using them. Any review platform that tells you that their models are verified and, and work well everywhere uh, either doesn't understand how these models work or is lying to you. Um, there is no perfect way to create a model for every systematic review. Okay, another, uh, another example of what you can do to use Sysrev to create machine learning models is our Gene Hunter project. Uh, you can read about this project on blog.sysrev.com slash simple NER. Um, in this case, we recruited about 10 reviewers and we asked them to extract genes from medical titles and abstracts. Uh, and we wanted them to do that for about, about 10,000 sentences. Um, 
and that ends up being about uh, 1,000 to 2,000 um, titles and abstracts. <clears throat> 10,000 is a magical number because there's a, there's a highly used data set out there done by BioCreative, which is the exact same project, extracting gene names from titles and abstracts uh, involving multiple institutions. I don't know how long their time frame was or what their financing was. Um, our goal was just to do this quickly and cheaply, and, and uh, we were able to complete this project for under $2,000 in two weeks. Um, so reviewers come in, they select a gene, and they save that. You can see the reviewer selected Y1 here. Um, after they'd done this for 10,000 sentences, we were able to create a model that replicates this. If I go to blog.sysserve.com slash simple NER, if any of you are developers in the audience, um, you can see it's really quite simple to put together this model. You have to import our PySysRev package. You can get all the training data with one line um, for, for creating this uh, named any recognition model. We're going to use Spacey for this. You can see it's really just like 20 lines that create your own model that can identify genes and documents. Um, Spacey is a really awesome package to do this with. <clears throat> Okay, once you have a model that can identify genes and text, you can do fun things like uh, scale that up to all the longevity literature and discover that, hey, cert one is pretty important, FOXO is pretty important, uh, DAF2 is in there. Um, the reason I'm mentioning those genes is because Cynthia Kenyon at Calico Labs has a, has a great TED talk about longevity research, and she brings up a lot of the same genes. We built a toy application. If you all go there right now, it's going to break. It's not meant to be used with lots of users at the same time, um, but it'll come back up eventually. You can keep pinging it. If I search for breast cancer, uh, you'll see that it's going to scan through, scan through a random selection of PubMed documents, and uh, it's going to come up with HER2 being the most important gene or the most highly cited gene, BRCA1, BRCA2, uh, pretty high up there as well. Okay, the last thing I'm going to talk about is concordance. How do you tell uh, which answer is right if you have multiple people reviewing the same article? Uh, to illustrate this, I'm going to look at the NIHS uh, Cancer Hallmarks Review, sysrev.com slash p slash 3588. And uh, what you can see here is that there are a lot of reviewers in this project, but relatively few active reviewers. And for this project, our models actually don't work all that well. And so you can see there is sort of a, a distinct distribution for included articles and excluded articles, uh, but there's definitely a lot of overlap. So I don't know exactly why uh, that's happening. It could be that this is a particularly difficult project. Um, but if I go ahead and look at another beta application we're building, which is made possible by the open access aspect of SysRev, I can go to analytics.sysrev um, project 3588. This is a beta. Um, so not everything is going to work perfectly. You can see there are 21 labels that are being assigned in this project, um, uh, this, this NIHS project, 86,000 articles. And one thing you can see is actually concordance on the level of the label. So how often do reviewers agree about the organism in a given document? Um, you can see about 90% of the time. And that's probably because it's pretty easy to determine what organism um, is in a, a given document. Are they talking about rats or mice or, or whatever? Uh, publication type is also pretty easy. Actually, screening is, is highly concordant as well, about 70%. Maybe you would want that a little bit higher. But Hallmarks is actually really low. And so immediately, this is valuable information, because if you're the administrator of this project, you might say, OK, well, maybe we haven't defined Hallmarks well enough. Um, or maybe you know, we've allowed reviewers to, to uh, skip Hallmarks. And so they're going to be less concordant. Some reviewers are assigning it. Some reviewers aren't. Uh, but in any case, uh, I, one, one, one interesting thing happening here with concordance is that it appears that the labels are sort of sorted by what we would think their level of complexity is, or what I would think it is. We can also look at concordance on the level of the individual reviewer. Um, this is something we're actively developing on. Um, it's, it's important to consider that just because a reviewer has low concordance doesn't mean they're a bad reviewer. Uh, for example, Alexander Burrell, who's one of the administrators on this project, actually has a concordance of 59%. Um, so if we click on him, we can see, well, he's got a really high concurrence with Nicole Kleinscher, who's another administrator on this project. Uh, so it could be that the admins are getting everything right, and some of the people they're reviewing with, um, namely Biss and W here, uh, maybe is you know maybe misunderstood the goal a little bit. Uh, is aligning less well with the administrators. So a lot to think about there. Okay, here are some screenshots, and. Finally, here are some projects that I picked out that I thought you might be interested in. These are some of the things people are doing with CISRO right now. Uh, CISRO public projects are completely free. 
Uh, and we are going to try to keep it that way. Um, private projects that you don't share with the world that Google won't index uh, cost about $10 a month. So if you want to be able to create unlimited number of private reviews, it's $10 a month. And you can invite as many reviewers as you want to those reviews, but you can only have one administrator, namely you. Uh, if you want to create a team account, so you can have multiple in administrators on each project, on, on each private project, uh, you get five administrators for $30 a month, and then it's just $10 a month for every administrator thereafter, and you can still invite as many reviewers as you want. <clears throat> so that's it. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this presentation, and I hope there are some use cases that, uh, that you, you could see using Cicero for. Uh, if you want to talk to me about any of this, uh, you can ping me on Twitter at Tomlu, T-O-M-L-U-E, or at Sysrev1, S-Y-S-R-E-V-1. Uh, you can also email me at tom at sysrev.com. And uh, yeah, thank you very much.